Good evening, everybody, and I hope you guys are ready to talk some more TSR. It's that time again, once again, three more weeks. Um, hey, everybody, um, my name is Chris. I am your host, and to my virtual right or left is Rick, our co-host. How are you doing there, Rick? I'm doing very good, Chris. Uh, just uh, watching the storm here. We're, we're getting the end of, uh, I guess it's Henry here, and uh, I'm hoping my power stays on and everything. Yeah, works. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah, one of those rare, um, you know, possibly a sign of global warming, um, you know, a hurricane actually making landfall up in the northeast, up uh, apparently yeah. north of us up in uh, Rhode Island, but we've been getting rain all day here in the northeast. So um, yeah, kind of a downer of a day, downer of a Sunday, but that's not going to dampen what we got going on tonight because Not we got an amazing show for you guys lined up um you can see over my shoulder we got the temple of elemental evil up there um so a couple of really cool things um uh i have been getting text alerts from uh the dark master um all weekend uh about the status of uh the temple of elemental evil um arriving at the warehouse um, I wish I had awesome news, <laughs> um, but it hasn't quite made it yet. Um, very, very soon. Um, we anticipate that the books are going to be there literally any day now. Um, and then shipping uh, to all the pre-orders will start. Um, there's so many pre-orders, however, um, that's going to take a couple of weeks. So um, I know we were telling everybody that we were going to be shipping out in August. I know this is the 20, what are we, 23rd, 22nd today. Um, so, you know, it'll probably start in August, but but the majority of them will probably go out in September. So for those of you guys waiting for your books, you know, hopefully September, um, I hope you guys understand that there are a lot of shipping issues in the world right now. Um, and as a matter of fact, um, you know, not all of the books are coming at one time because of that, because uh, space is at a premium in containers. So, so some sort of good news there. Um, uh, and I would like to also announce a couple of things in September. We have a lot of uh, Temple of Elemental Evil content that's going to be coming at you guys. Um, uh, and that's going to include, um, uh, in addition to 20 sides to every story, they've been running their playthroughs every week uh, for Temple of Elemental Evil. I believe they are in the temple right now. Um, and uh, so they're going to continue. Um, also in September, we have not figured the date out. We will get that sorted out and we will um, let folks know on our website. Uh, there will be another playthrough, probably of one of the elemental nodes that we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, there's going to be an unboxing video um, that we're going to do. Um, and in addition to that, uh, there's probably going to be another surprise or two that we're not, not quite ready to announce yet, but uh, we will be announcing very soon. So keep checking. Uh, the Gooming Games website uh, for announcements, um, and uh, and it's going to be uh, September is going to be the month of Tel Temple of Elemental Evil. So, um, and and tonight's show, uh, this is our final show on uh, our deep dive into the original and the uh, the five E conversion. We are going to talk all about the elemental nodes today, and there's a very important reason why we're going to talk about the elemental nodes for an entire show is because we got to actually design them completely um, for fifth edition. So, um, so it's pretty exciting. So, uh, Rick, give me a thumb scale, overhead view, whatever you want to call it, high level view of the original Temple of Elemental Evil elemental nodes. Sure. Um, well, for those who maybe aren't directly familiar with them, the original presentation of the elemental nodes was very bare bones in the original. You were yeah. given, I would call it an outline, almost a bullet list and that you were given a list of monsters, a list of treasures, and a list of areas. And I think each area had maybe one or two sentences, you know, a little bit about elevation and perhaps, you know, altitude kind of notations in there, yeah. um, and not a whole lot else. Um, and it, it absolutely had that B1 feel of do it yourself to it. And I, I didn't mind those kind of things when I was younger, but I think because Nulb had also been given sort of that short shrift and not detailed to the level I would want, I remember even originally reading the work as when I got to the notes thinking, oh, I wish this had been detailed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it almost felt like, part of it felt like they were like letting us do it ourselves, but part of it felt like they were taking the easy way out. I almost got the feeling that, you know, they, they finished the temple and they were exhausted and they were lucky they got that done and they just wanted to get the book out and you know there, there it was to be honest you know I had that sense 
Um, so there really isn't a whole lot there. So if you're a do-it-yourself, it was fine, but it always, I always felt it was lacking. Um, yeah, definitely. And so, it's... you know, certainly our charge of uh, expanding it and detailing every, every area, which we did, was very exciting to me. Um, Cause I think as we've talked before, Chris, like the majority of this book we've done or more or less translation to 5e, but we've really kept it very close. have not come up with a lot of original material, but the nodes is very different. And that's kind of why we wanted to do this show, right? We wanted to kind of give the nodes their own show because it was a different treatment, I think, from most of the rest of the book. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, 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 and um, a shout out to our producer, Elena, doing an awesome job behind the glass. She put up there um, a screenshot of the original fire um, elemental node. It would all fit on one page. It actually, there was room for, I think, another node on there too. Um, but basically, yeah, you got a map, you got a couple of paragraphs, and then you you got an outline. And it was basically like, you know, fire toads in this room, fire red dragons in that room. Yeah. And there might have been another little hint about something like treasure or something like that, or, or you know, these are the pets of the fire giants or whatnot. But but that was it. So we, we took those outlines. So obviously, we took the map we didn't change the maps any uh we updated them they are the exact same maps but we, we've got them updated we're going to show those off um when we get into each individual node um and then we actually took that outline that um gygax did or mensor did um and then we actually tried to stay faithful to that outline mm -hmm. and we tried to put the same critters in the same room some of them were nebulous some of them were just like in the wandering monster sections um, but then we, we actually then designed the entire uh, rooms out and gave them e each node is its entire chapter. Um, and it's, you know, each encounter has got your read aloud text. It's got your, your monster, your tactics. It's got, you know, and, and, and another thing to probably note, a lot of the monsters were some of those, um, strange monsters in the theme folio and the monster menu volume two that, that haven't exactly been translated to fifth edition yet. So mm -hmm. we, we got a chance to do those. There was probably four to six on each node yeah. that we had to actually design out those uh, the wonderful elemental grooves if folks mm -hmm. remember those those weird freaking things <laughs> um so we got to play around with those um as as well so uh so that was a lot of fun um any other thoughts on the original yeah. no not right off the top of my head but that you do raise a good point in that yeah we were absolutely faithful to what was there in that if the original outline hinted a certain monster was in a certain area, or if it said just a very brief description like this cave has got an icy wall to the north, we held to that. So we tried to be absolutely faithful to that. Um, but and as Chris said, there is a heck of a lot of new monsters, um, you know, new to fifth edition yeah. in this. I was actually frankly surprised of just how many, I, I think, over the course of the whole Temple of Elemental Evil, you know, the two book set. I think I designed over 30 new monsters that were basically monsters from either the Fiend Folio or the Monster Manual 2. And those that remember the temple, it seemed to me that Gygax was really leaning in on those books when he, like, it, there seemed to be a purposeful effort by Gary Gygax to include, and, and Menser for that matter, to include creatures from those two books, specifically from the Monster Manual 2, which was fairly recent. And uh, the Fiend Folio in this book, where previously, you know, you didn't really see too many appearances by those creatures. So yeah, um, that was indeed fun, though, to kind of, you know, try to recreate those creatures for fifth edition. And for every one I did, I went back to the original source, and I very carefully read the original descriptions in the monster books, you know, of the time and, and tried to, again, keep them faithful. Yes, no, that's great. Um, I see that Alex from 20 Sides Every Story is in the chat. Um, he said, yep, they are getting ready to break down the doors into the, um, the temple uh, coming up very soon. Also, he notes that he ran the air node at Dungeon Con Online, and he notes that the, the nodes make very good one shots. Um, you know, hmm. you probably do them in an evening, maybe two evenings. Um, but um, I, I've had uh, several of my playtesters run them at conventions. Uh, we're probably going to run a couple of them uh, up in uh, Empire of Cyclops Con coming up. Um, and then that playthrough, we're going to do that special playthrough in September is going to feature one of the nodes. So yeah, so these are these are great little pieces that you can kind of just pull out, even if you're not running the whole, um, the whole module, you can pull out a node and just say, hey, we're going to do an air, you know, themed kind of night tonight, uh, which works out pretty well. And, and, and I do, I, I agree with, with, with Rick, 
I do feel the original a little bit of a B1 kind of a feel of like it's not complete, it's not there. I honestly think they just, you know, if they would have detailed the nodes, um, our 128 page super module would have been 156 pages, probably. I, I yeah. honestly just think they got to that point and they were like, wow, are we going to really add another 30 pages onto this yeah. or, you yeah. know, or T T1 through five, you know? Um, so that's my thought because, you know, you got all the setup with the, mm -hmm. with the, there was a whole introductory chapter that dealt with, um, um, the, the modifications to spells, uh, wandering encounters and everything. And we faithfully reproduced all of those. Um, we, uh, we, we, we reproduced that chapter and we actually went through, there was a, a spell list that was like a page long, mm -hmm. uh, that Gary put in there about, um, you know, when you're on the nodes, different things happen and then spells, you can, you can warp spells too. Like you can take a fireball and you can cast it as an ice ball. So we have rules in there so that wizards can actually do that. Wizards and, and arcane spellcasters can actually learn ways to cast fireball differently, like an acid ball or a lightning ball. Um, and those those rules are, are contained in the module. Um, and it's actually kind of cool. The more you try to cast it, the more you try to learn to do it, the easier it actually gets. And that, that's a carryover right from uh, right from the first edition, where I believe it was if you cast it, if you attempted to cast that spell like three times, you automatically you you learned it. You learned how to how to warp the magic and everything. So we we carried that right over. So um, so yeah. Um, and uh, like I said, we we have we have wandering monsters. There's a general wandering monster mm -hmm. table that's for all of the nodes. Um, it contains a lot of uh, fungus type creatures, and then each individual node has its own you know elemental themed. Uh, wandering monster encounter um, table that's in there. Uh, so uh, yeah, so it's it's a lot of fun. Um, it's a really good time just to, to check up. On I think our... I think we have a sample wandering monster page, don't we? That I think we, we do up. actually. If Elena, if you want to oh, pull that up, we can pull that up. The wandering monsters. Um, and you know, for those two, at least for my part, whenever I design the wandering monsters for the elemental nodes that I covered, in my case, it was air and earth. I kind of tried to hone to two things. I I tried to think of ecology, so sort of bring that modern day design element into it. And then I really tried to think about territorialism and you know what creatures would stick to what areas and how the creatures would interact with each other. So I did kind of yield to that modern day element. But then on the flip side, I tried to very much stick to as many older monsters as possible instead of trying to just throw away the old monsters, you know, and kind of bring in new fifth edition creators. When in doubt, I updated the older creatures and I tried very much to stick to anything that was mentioned in the original, again, to kind of give it that classic feel where, you know, you'd see those same creatures and, and those, you know, give that same feel because my goal throughout this book was always to keep it close to the original material whenever I could. So it was it was an interesting mix of old and new, I thought, doing the Wandering Monsters. It was kind of fun. Great. Um, excellent. All right. So let's um, move on to, so we're going to do things a little bit differently. So normally we give you guys a top five or sometimes a top 10 list, but we have four different nodes. Mm -hmm. So we're going to actually take each node in turn and we're going to talk a little bit about it. Uh, Rick designed two of the nodes. Um, I designed another node. Um, and then uh, uh, James Floyd uh, Kelly actually designed the fire node. Um, so I'll talk about the fire node a little bit there. Um, so, uh, so we're gonna talk about each node in, in turn. Um, mm -hmm. And then we're gonna give you our favorite encounter from each of us for that specific node. So you guys are only, get, we're, 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 we're cheap in you guys. You guys are only getting a top four <laughs> list tonight. Um, but anyway, we just figured that would kind of work out a little bit better. So it's a little bit different. Um, but we'll give it um, a thing. We do have a question in the chat here. How much do you guys all take into account that fighters, barbarians, rogues, etc., are a tad more versatile, maybe even more dangerous uh, than first edition? Uh, that's a great, great question. Yeah. So these uh, translations are exactly from the original material. So, and, and this is the example I always use. If there was 17 orcs in Encounter 1 mm -hmm. in the first edition module, there are 17 orcs in Encounter 1 um, in the fifth edition conversion. So uh, back when we were doing B1 and B2, the very first book in this series, uh, we actually had to sit down and come up with a de design philosophy that we were going to be consistent. And the thought was, we have two ways we can do this. We can either translate it directly um, yeah. and, and be as faithful to the original as possible, or we can balance things for the modern gamer for fifth edition. Um, and then we decided 
to do the, the former. We decided to keep it the way that it was to kind of keep it in that, you know, the guy gets voice as best we can. So that does lead to issues with uh, balancing in the modern, uh, you know, obviously there were no tieflings back then. There was no sorcerers. There was no, um, you know, so that definitely changes things. Yeah. We do kind of give the game master all the tools in the beginning of the book to kind of how to adjust um you know how to adjust encounters based on challenge rating and i know that's a dirty word um because the challenge rating system is you know was it it's like the pirate's code it's more like guidelines it's not you know not really like official so um so anyway we, we give all those tools and and then hopefully the game master is going to be able to because i mean groups are so varied and now with all yeah. the additional subclasses and all the additional archetypes from other sources and everything uh, some of those are not as balanced as the ones in the player's handbook. It's yeah. just like, it's impossible. So really, really the, good question. Yeah. And, yeah, and on the flip side, in cases when there are class types among the enemies where the NPC enemies of which there are quite a few in this mm -hmm. temple, <laughs> you know, you have plenty of evil clerics running around and that kind of thing. Um, in those cases, there is modifications to levels and things like that, because I think yeah. as we all understand a, fifth edition, uh, you know, wizard of fifth level is certainly more powerful perhaps than a fifth edition magic user of yore. So yeah. there were some cases where I could say like, you know, generally levels might be a little lower um, and that kind of thing, or, or multi-class might be, situations might be a little mixed where we might've had like an assassin slash something in the original and that, you know, maybe declare there's a slight class modification. So in cases with enemies, not taking into account player characters, but taking account NPCs, we did make modifications to sort of basically keep them a little more in line. Uh, yeah. So the challenge, you know, ratings wouldn't be kind of blown off the chart either way up, you know, too easy or too hard. Yeah, great. Um, okay, uh, so we are going to move on. We're going to talk first about the air elemental node. And if Elena, if you want to pop up the map of the air elemental node in front of us, um, We'll get going. So uh, this was a node that Rick created. So Rick, give us a, a, a just a, an overhead view of like what some of your goals and stuff and about the sure. air elemental node are. Sure. Um, obviously, the air elemental node bears down on that element. And, you know, overall, my original impression on all the nodes was that they came off as a little vanilla. They came off as more of places where there were those type of creatures in there you know like yeah. the fire level came up as a dungeon level that had a lot of fire creatures as opposed to a real elemental node or demi plane or a place that was really affiliated with the plane of fire so my major overall goal was to instill more of an element to each node you know not beyond the monsters to actually give the place a feeling of that element um, and that meant, in my case, like giving a lot of special effects, I, I, for lack of a better term, to some of the rooms. So in the Earth Node, for instance, beyond the fact that you have a lot of Earth-type monsters or monsters that enjoy that environment, you have uh, caverns full of choking dust. You have caverns where, you know, the mud does unusual things if you step into mud or where you know, boulders or things might act unusual. And there's an area of shifting passages that shift on their own. And basically a lot of different effects that to me kind of riff off of that elemental thing. And that was what, that was probably my primary goal was to inject that. Cause I always felt that was missing from the original. I remember looking at the earth elemental, uh, I mean, excuse me, the earth note uh, in, in the original way back in the day when I first read it and thinking, well, this is kind of a bunch of caves with a bunch of earth monsters. And I wanted more than that. Yeah. And I think we really successfully did that for all four of the nodes, you know, regardless of who the author was, whether it was me or Chris or whoever wrote it, I feel like we really instilled a personality to each node. So I'm, I'm frankly very proud of what we did there. Uh, I think it came off the way, you know, I intended certainly. Yeah, that was definitely one of our design philosophies going in. We wanted to make it, yeah, it, it, essentially they are, it's a map and they are a collection of, of dungeons with, with you know, a particular theme of, of monster in them. But we wanted to kind of step it up and we want it. So there's, there's some rooms where there's, there's no monster, but there's like, you know, strange howling wind or something. And it mm -hmm. might not have an effect. It might do something. Um, but, yeah, it's just something to put the characters on edge, kind of keep them yeah. on their toes. There's a couple of weird things in there. 
that are you know kind of puzzly kind of things you know mm-hmm. um some interesting environments that that they have to kind of deal with and everything uh one of the other problems that you know and, and this is not something that's uncommon but this this comes up um all the time when we're doing these conversions is you know one room you have you know eight vapor rats and they each have you know one half hit die and they probably have like a quarter one one quarter probably cr and in the next room you have six fire giants and and you know each of them are cr nine and and you know if a party seventh level party wanders into the fire giant room they're they're done they're toast they're they're probably not going to live so we got to play around with we still kept the fire giants in there for example um or cloud giants or whatever but how do we make that encounter not just an instant TPK? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and we balance that there was dragons in a lot of these, multiple dragons at the water level. There was multiple dragon turtles. Um, dragon turtles are like CR 15 or something. They're like <laughs> one dragon turtle is bad. Two dragon turtles is really bad. So, so we had a lot of fun actually kind of thinking outside of the box a little bit. Um, and, and how do we make those encounters work? you know so that you you've got to you know hey if you don't do it right and if you tick off the dragon turtles he's still going to probably kill you but there's probably an out there where if you're if you're yeah. a little bit astute you can figure it out and, th- and that's an area we kind of i saw that we played in in more than one node was the idea of allies you know the idea that there were potential creatures that if you couldn't secure them as allies, you could at least potentially either get information from them or yeah. or they wouldn't perhaps be instantly hostile. And, and as Chris said, sometimes you will find that those are the creatures that could really destroy a party outright, if not yeah. handled carefully. Um, like I had an area in the air, uh, air node that was full of cloud giants and a whole bunch of cloud giants could certainly be dangerous to a party at the level, presumably they're gonna enter the air node. So I gave some potential there, depending on how you act and how, you know, whether you've interacted with other cloud giants before arriving into their lair and and different factors that could mitigate perhaps how aggressive they are. Um, So we tried to tune things down a little bit there, but again, at the same time, still, still keeping those original designated creatures in those areas. Um, It's an interesting balance to pull, you know? Yeah. And, and then the, also the classic trope, which is very, Gygax in very first edition is they might not necessarily be allies with you, but they won't necessarily be allies with the creature that's living next door. Mm-hmm. So you can pit the two monsters together and and um that and I'll talk a bit, little bit about that on some of my levels on how I kind of worked those interactions in, um, which I think is just exactly classic, very, very classic. Well, that's B2 right there. You know, there was orc mm-hmm. layers and they didn't get along and the orcs and the goblins and everything. So um excellent so all right well it was your it was your node the air node so why don't you start off with your favorite encounter rick give us a give us a little rundown on it all right um and it's just a weird encounter but my favorite encounter in the air node is probably uh area 32 which is the crystal cavern um this essentially is just a weird place where the characters enter a cave and there are crystals hanging suspended in air and if the characters linger in this cave and it is an important cave because this is a cave that can potentially you know link to one of the other nodes so it kind of is a cave that the characters eventually sooner or later want to get in there and visit um if the characters linger these suspended crystals in the air start turning they look sort of like giant snowflakes and they start spinning and then they start humming and that hum gets louder and louder and eventually that hum starts damaging the cra- uh, the characters and they could potentially even shatter their equipment or shatter things they are carrying such as potions and sort of act like an enhanced shatter spell and in very gygaxian fashion i listed a specific uh, a series of specific ways you could address these you know how these crystals you know could be destroyed or not destroyed certain magics that are more effective or less to, a less effective because Gygax would do that a lot of times in different modules you know he would give you that list of a few key spells that would have certain effects mm-hmm. and I always liked that you know in the Tumaharas and these different modules when I would see that so I tried to incorporate that in here um, so yeah it was just something very unusual but again and hitting that idea of taking this this node and really making it fun because I think originally out of the four nodes I probably found the idea of, a, of an air node the, mer- the least interesting when I originally read this work when I was younger. And yet 
coming back to the present day working on this, I actually got really excited about the error note. I found myself really having fun working on it. And by the time I was done with it, I was just like, this is really fun because there aren't a lot of opportunities for characters to visit elemental planes and certainly not without being subjected to extremely adverse conditions or very dangerous situations. And to me, this, after all the many levels of the dungeon, the kind of more traditional dungeon in the tel uh, Temple of Elemental Evil, the nodes are such a great place to shake it up and give people something fresh and kind of give them a taste of the elements without them actually going to the real elemental planes. Yeah. So it's like, it's potentially, like you said, it's like, a, it's just a, it's a good one shot. It's, it's a, it's a great place to just shake things up and make things a little different after characters have really been spending a lot of time kind of grinding through the rest of the temple. Um, so anyway, that's, that's my favorite area is the, the crystal cavern. Agree. All right. Excellent. Um, that was on my short list, um, but it did not make it, but I, I did <laughs> definitely gravitate towards that encounter. Uh, my favorite encounter is area three, the North floor area. So this was kind of weird. This was like a very big open area, hundreds of feet by hundreds of feet. Um, it was kind of like, wow, what do we kind of make something interesting there? And uh, so we uh, we actually have a uh, strange obelisk that's out there. And then there's these um, bubbles floating around um, and they're all at random, in typical Gygax fashion at random mm -hmm. heights and whatnot. Oh, cool. We've got a, a Atlanta threw up the picture there. Um, and, and, and inside each of these bubbles are, are some, so there might be a creature inside, there might be some treasure inside, there might be a trap inside, it might be just a regular old like skull or something inside. Um, and you can pop these, certainly, um, and then something will come out. Um, I think there's like an enraged air elemental stuck in one. And, and the, the idea with the obelisk here was it had a flat top. Um, if you set something up on top of the obelisk, and if you read the runes on it, uh, you could actually create the bubble around it and then it would go floating off so it was just a, a neat little it's just a different kind of a thing um mm -hmm. to just kind of make it interesting so you could actually be in another encounter area and run into one of these bubbles these bubbles could be all over the uh the entire we probably should have put them in the wandering encounter table actually <laughs> um thinking about it now oh geez it's a little late now maybe on the second printing um but you know just just kind of like you said different We're trying mm -hmm. to come up with some different ways to present things yeah. um and i think um and i love that too and then of course then to kind of like make it to tie it all in together we you know i threw a, we threw a giant gelatinous cube that used to wander around too you can actually wander around in in like four or five different areas mm -hmm. and then you roll dice to see like which area he was in so mm -hmm. um so that was always kind of cool again very very gygaxian with yeah. random encounter tables and sub tables and you know roll a die to see where the gelatinous cube is at any given time so that when you come into this area you might not necessarily be there so uh so that was my favorite encounter of the air of the air node um and we should know uh, nice. uh, rick actually touched on it so there are these gates that are hidden around and the gates are how you jump back and forth between the nodes and then there's also gates that will send you actually to the elemental planes the actual mm -hmm. elemental planes um, so yeah, they, they really, um, you know, they, they, the original authors really encouraged you to, to um, explore all the little corners of this because you had to kind of, once you were on the fire gate, you're like, well, now I got to try and find my way back. You had to find the appropriate gate um, to get out. So, um, so that's where we go there. So I think we're going to move on now to fire elemental node. Oh, yeah. Um, so Elena, if you would pop that map up, we do have a question here for, let's see if it's a question, uh, from Thick Skull Adventures, um, soft spot for the temple, always DM'd it, um, my other brother actually DM'd us through, looking forward to the, uh, the DCC if, uh, if and when this comes out, so, all right, excellent, well, thank you guys for that, loving it, so, um, all right, so the fire node, um, so again, this is basically, uh, I believe it was, uh, it was nicknamed the uh, the fire, the fire pits. I believe it was nicknamed. So it was just a collection of of underground chambers, um, a little bit more finished stonework here, um, and uh, and then you had just a just a collection of fire themed um, creatures that were in here. But there were a lot of really good, interesting, interesting uh, architecture and interesting, um, you know, layouts of uh, environments. Uh, you know, when we when we were working on this one, it was really about okay you know, fire hurts <laughs> everybody that's not immune to it. How do we not overwhelm people with fire damage? Um, how do we kind of just highlight the 
some of the other aspects of fire, um, smoke, obviously, um, you know, smells, uh, sulfur, uh, that kind of thing. Um, this one was a little bit tricky. There was two adult red dragons here, um, and they were a mated pair, and that's that's not good <laughs> in fifth edition terms. No. Um, I believe they're each CR like 15 or something crazy like that, or 14. Um, so, uh, so we had to kind of devise how that was going to work. So obviously they're a mated pair, but they're having some marriage issues. Um, and they were actually not exactly friendly to each other. So they were split up on different sides of the, of the node. Um, and, uh, so they wouldn't actually, you know, go after you together. Um, you could certainly run into them and, and, and raise their ire and get into combat with them. Um, but you could also play up that, um, competition between the two. Um, and you could actually end up running errands for them. Um, I believe you run into the, the male dragons, probably it's near the beginning of the dungeon. You know, he's like, after you prove your worth to him, you know, then he maybe he'll send you on an errand to go try and win, win, win her favors back. And so anyway, you can kind of become these pawns and you can kind of actually end up kind of being their lackeys and everything. But being their lackeys when you're seventh <laughs> level or eighth level is much better than just taking the breath weapon to the face, in my opinion. Um, so that's kind of how we got around that one. Um, but yeah, it was a lot of fun. Um, anything that you remember from the fire uh, elemental node? Yeah, and I, I, you know, looking at it, I always, I think for the DM to develop and even for us to develop, in a way it's the most challenging, one of the most challenging nodes because yeah. it has the most traditional dungeon look to it. Yep. And it's a cool layout of rooms, but it is a more traditional dungeon layout. And there's some very similar rooms and it's, uh, you know, I think it'd be easy to fall into the trap of making a bunch of very similar rooms or just throwing creatures in. And I think the way it came out was really good because as you said, there's a lot of, having read it, there's a lot of descriptions about humidity and, you know, steam and smoke and visibility and things that maybe don't come to mind immediately with fire because it's just way too easy to just have every room have a fire pit and be done with it. Yeah. Um, oh, oh, there so are I, fire pits, though. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That, that, yeah, <laughs> that being fire said, pits. there are fire there pits are and fire dangerous pits. ones at that. Um, yes. Yes. There certainly um, are fire pits. <laughs> but you know, I think you know, it, I think it came out really well. I think you know, you really helped bring it above and beyond. You know, the original premise, which is nice. Um, so what what do you think? Do you want to say your favorite area first? And so uh, uh, yeah, I'll I'll go with my favorite that? area first. So, so this one does kind of tie into one of those encounters that would be potentially overbalanced if if you just ran it straight. So there was supposed to be a group of six fire giants. Mm -hmm. um, so I split one of the fire giants off and kind of put them off to the side. The other fire giants, I made them um, juveniles on holiday. So they were literally just having a good time. Basically. They were viewing the fire um, elemental node as a place you would go, like the Riviera or you know, uh, you know, the islands, to kind of just blow off some steam. No, no pun intended, um, and and just have a good time. So one of the rooms that uh, they were in, there was this really long corridor hall-like room, um, and I looked at it, and the first thing I thought of when I saw it was, huh, bowling alley. So. Um, you know, took volcanic glass-like stone. That was the floor. Um, the giants knocked down. They, they cut off some uh, stalactites and and inverted them and set them up like pins. And then they would roll their boulders down uh, the corridor and play bowling, basically. And this was basically their idea to have a great time. Um, of course, the entrance to the room that the characters most likely will use is at the far end where the pins are. And they walk in, and then there are all the giants on the other side. So the giants instantly just start rolling the balls down, and you know the PCs need to need, need to dodge out of the way and 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 or jump over them. And we've got a whole bunch of rules in there for that. Um, but it's interesting. Um, you know, we, we set it up that you know if a fire giant throws a boulder at you, you know it does like I don't know four to ten damage. But if he rolls a boulder at you, a you've got another chance to you know not get hit by it. But if you did get hit by it, it didn't hurt as much as the regular boulder. So it was a really nice way to kind of bring back the lethality of all of them and then the fact that they were just juveniles even though their stats were all the same they were just there having a good time if, if mm -hmm. the characters play along and dodge for a little bit and make it to the other end where the giants are there's no big combat they just all like pat them on the back and correct congratulate them like they're you know guys in a bowling league um and and they have a good time and they invite them for a meal and and then it turns into kind of a social encounter so um but again 
if the PCs feel threatened by the balls rolling down the quote unquote alley at them and they, you know, start casting you know, ice storm or something like that, well, then the Giants are going to pick up the boulders and start throwing them and you're going to have a more traditional encounter. So, um, so again, give, giving the piece, giving the game master some options to not necessarily have the lethality just run over um, probably yeah. a bunch of seventh level characters or maybe not even seventh level the way they could stumble into the, uh, the nodes by mistake. So, so that was my favorite encounter. Nice. Um, well, I'm going to throw out my honorable mentions first. I have just real super briefly uh, one area that came close just because I thought that the coolness factor is there is a, a chamber that has a delayed blast fireball hanging in the air. And to me, just for the fearness, kind of fierce factor of just walking into a room and seeing this ball of fire hovering in the air, and then perhaps the characters connecting the dots and realizing what this is, and maybe wondering how or if it's going to be activated, which it can be. Um, I thought that was just such a cool idea, the idea of just coming in and finding the suspended fireball. Um, and then there was a separate kind of room where there's... Um, almost like a lake of fire or kind of, you know, a, a boiling kind of thing. And there are these pumice stones or pumice stones, I forget how you pronounce it. And the characters really have to sort of, you know, run their way across this. And I incorporated a lot of that kind of jumping from platform to platform type stuff in my own dungeon. So I have a soft spot for it. And I think now every time I see those kind of things, I think of that old Japanese game show that Takashi, Takahashi's Castle or whatever it was called, you know, the MXC, they call it in, in the United States. I always think of the people running across the river on the stones, you know, and falling in the water. <laughs> so I have a soft spot for that, perhaps. Um, but to get to my main actual area that I picked is my favorite, and we have our first crossover, Big O. Oh. Uh, it was Area 34, the large corridor with the fire giant, quote unquote, bowling alley. Um, for all the reasons Chris just mentioned, I love the fact that the giants are juvenile. I love the fact that they're kind of frankly playing around and the characters may not necessarily put that together instantly. So there's a little, you know, you got to see how the players go through it and play it and how they react because how the giants react can really depend, as Chris said, how deadly the giants respond really depends on how seriously sort of the characters take it where here the characters are getting hit by these sort of bowling balls and taking some damage, but not taking the full damage that the giants could throw out. And if the characters play it right, they could literally just have a meal with these giants afterward or even potentially be rewarded by them. And I just think, I love that. It, it makes it a really cool, fun kind of encounter. And there's even a chance for like a little humor in there, you know, to kind of break up the sure, you know, terror of going through this big level of fire. So yeah, that's, that's my favorite area too, the uh, fire giant bowling alley. All right, crossover number one. Number one, uh, Bing. <laughs> yeah, I think there's going to be another. Just, just going to say that. Just going to say that. Yeah, um, and I'm glad you mentioned the 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 Lake of Fire one, um, inspired by the great great 1981 movie Dragon Slayer, with the Lake of Fire. Oh yeah. So and the pumice stones was just like normally. I, I'm a big fan of stepping stones, jumping yeah. stepping stone. But then I was like, oh, I'm like pumice floats, and I'm like, wouldn't it be cool? if the stones actually bob and that would just add oh, yeah. a whole other layer to it so um yeah so a lot of fun i think there. ever since the original white plume mountain with the kind of hanging platforms on the chains i think yep. that was probably the first time i encountered that sort of thing in a module one of the first and a lot of the early modules had that kind of stuff oh yeah stuff. oh yeah and i have yeah. i have used that a lot even in my uh, adventure that was published in dungeon magazine many years ago i did some sort of variation of the stepping stone you know <laughs> thing i have such a soft spot for that so yeah such a great encounter very right. cool so let's move to the earth node also, all right but also designed by rick yeah so um give... i think we have an earth node map we can throw yes. up there um again tried to you know take an area that could have been very you know um I, for lack of a better term, boring and just a bunch of caves. And I really tried to put a lot of those effects in there and really try to have fun with it. Um, my favorite encounter was a largest, uh, largest, ca largest cave that uh, I call the Great Face. It's area 12. And essentially, it's a large cave with a whole bunch of sort of natural ramps and, and levels along the walls, you know, different sort of ledges. 
all connected and there's the characters coming and there's lots of boulders kind of all up there and and a lot of these uh boulders are actually creatures called boulders which is a creature from the monster manual too and i always felt personally that boulders were probably in that same family as piercers and trappers and things of that ilk um but i don't think i ever saw them in a module you know and i i, I felt like they had to be in that family and they're just such a natural fit. So I threw a bunch of those in. And then at the far end of the cavern is this enormous face that's guaranteed to intrigue the characters or at least make them afraid. And I think we have a, a picture. I think we, we have a face graphic that we can show this for this room. And uh, yeah, I just, you know, so that I detailed too, where there's a series of encounters where like um, if the characters walk into, a ma into the mouth, they can trigger a certain trap and there's, you know, something about the mouth kind of closing and potentially crushing the characters. And that's after they get through this gauntlet of boulders. So all these different ramps, you know, these boulders can be kind of rolling down and trying to steamroll the characters and get an easy meal. Um, so it was fun. It was just, for me, it was a nice combination of like, as you said, balancing, taking the bowlers, which are a fairly weak creature compared to some other creatures on this level, mm -hmm and enhance the sort of danger of the room by then putting in this very uh, intriguing and dangerous face um, at the end of the room. So anyway, that's my favorite. I, I had a ball writing that one up, the great face. So, and, and, and our a crossover with another bowling themed encounter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we well, like, like to steamroll characters. I yeah, guess. yeah, which is actually crazy. So I have to I have to ask a question. I think I know the answer to this, but mm -hmm. you know, was was the great face inspired by Tome of Horrors? I maybe subconsciously. Um, it had to have been subconscious. Yeah, I mean, I mean, at least the artist was at least inspired I, by it. <laughs> absolutely. When I look at the, and I love the art, I always want to say, I want to give props to the art because I absolutely love the illustration that goes with this. I couldn't have come up with something better. Um, I don't think I was thinking that, like I said, unless subconsciously, though I'm, as you know, I'm a big fan of the Tomb of Horrors, so I wouldn't be surprised if it's rattling around in my head. Um, but certainly looking at the illustration, it screams, you know, big green face. So I love yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> as a fan of the Tomb of Horrors, I, I approve. I officially approve. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. So... Okay, um, so my favorite encounter on the Earth node, um, I looked long and hard. Um, I had a couple of other options. I, I kind of like the clay uh, simulacra mm -hmm. uh, room where um, you kind of had, yeah, you know, I'm a sucker for the statue galleries. Um, mm -hmm. And you had, you had your take on a statue gallery there, uh, which is interesting in, in the characters and they're walking down the, the corridor. The, the, the faces of the statues turn into faces of the characters, which is that'll just freak people out. Um, and then if they destroy them, that, that, that character's visage is on there, it actually takes extra damage. I thought that was really cool. Um, but at the end of the day, I had to go with Area 12, the Great Face, as my favorite encounter. <laughs> oh, because man. I love that encounter. That, that is the perfect encounter um, that it just checks off all the boxes for me. There's a lot going on. First of all, whenever you get a separate map for an encounter location, because it's that complicated and where you stand actually matters. Yeah. That's awesome. So the bowlers part was kind of cool. Um, and, and like you said, they're, they're really kind of insignificant monsters, but there mm -hmm. is, I think, 12 of them or 15 of them or something. Yeah. So that makes a difference. Um, but they're not really the hazard here. But then the face, the interaction with the face, and you had it like with a magic mouth on it and the eyes glowed. And if you go inside, there is a really nice magic item in there, but then the face, the, the mouth starts closing and then there's, you know, dexterity saving throws and whatnot. Try and grab the magic item, then you're at disadvantage. There was just so many good good components <laughs> that really makes a memorable encounter there um, that I, I, I just, I just, I went to that one. It was funny. That was the one I instantly thought of. And then I was like, oh, well, I'll find another one. And mm -hmm. then I went after my whole review. I'm like, nope, it's got to be that one. It's like, I, I think I did the same thing else. too. Yeah, I could I, try I to think personally, I did the same it. exact thing. I, I instantly thought of that. And I guess the fact that I thought of it says something, but I thought of the great face. And then I said, well, let me reread, you know. Yeah. And then I came back to that. And yeah, for the face trap too, it's like you said, I always enjoy those risk or reward type things, like those yeah. sort of, well, the characters can just run out of here and make this check, or they can try to grab this item on the way out. And, yeah. you know, 
because and, again, and, it's about player decision. It, it kind of now it bounces it to the players and it makes yeah. the players make that hard call. Do I want to risk this, you know, for that staff yeah. or whatever? Uh, so I, I always love kind of throwing those hard decisions at the players, you know, so. Yeah, and I, I won't spoil it, but it's a sweet magic item. It's a sweet, <laughs> sweet magic item, probably worth the risk, probably. You yeah, know, unless of course if you lose a character out of it, then it's yeah, then it, then, then it clearly wasn't worth it. <laughs> but yeah, it was definitely that. I, I agree with you, the risk or reward factor there. We talked about that um, when we were talking about on our, on our shows about L1 and L2, how um how len um the author of those modules was great with the i'm gonna give you something overpowered but then i'm mm -hmm. gonna just bring it back a little bit you know i'm gonna put some kind of little weakness or some kind of little drawback to it so that it's not all it's not all good so excellent so yes so we've had now have two crossovers the question is will we have Jeez. a third crossover well it's, it's entirely possible I yeah mean, it is well, possible yeah, it's certainly possible um okay so um, our last node for the night is the water node, which um, I got to develop. Um, so uh, if Alana could throw up the map for that, uh, that would be awesome. So the water node, also known as the uh, watery maze or the water maze. And <laughs> oh, there's my storm <laughs> alert. <laughs> yep, it's, yep, we're still getting storms in the Northeast. <laughs> and that's with the volume turned down on my phone too. That's what's great. <laughs> that was awesome. So I just thought you were really excited that we're finally onto the water. Yeah, I was like, so wow. For, for those of you folks who know, um, in a previous life, um, I was an aquatic biologist. So when we actually um, got to sort out all of these nodes, it was pretty obvious who was going to end up doing the water one. Um, at first, I didn't want to do it. Um, but then I was kind of like, oh, who am I kidding? I love messing around with water encounters. So we're going to jump right into it. So this was kind of like, it's kind of a big ocean, um, but there is, um, uh, there's a fair amount of, um, of land. And, and basically imagine a, a huge cavern uh, filled with an ocean um, in places. It's like a hundred and some odd feet deep. That was the first thing I went through was I actually added depths to it and actually gave a little bit of under, underwater kind of relief, if you will, kind of the reverse of like a, a topography map. But there were these rocky outcroppings. There were these like islands. Uh, there were a lot of shelves. And then there were some caves around the edges and that. And what was really kind of cool was the northern part of it was cold and frigid and icy. And in the southern part was kind of warm and not. So, um, so you actually got to play around with some cold critters um, in addition to aquatic critters. Um, and then when you got to the southern part, um, you you had a, a little bit, uh, you, you know, you had like more temperate kind of conditions. So that was kind of cool. Um, and again, this is the level with the two, not one, two dragon turtles. Mm. Um, so I had to split them up. Um, and one's a recent arrival. And actually, um, there's a really good chance that, that that one can become allied with the PCs. Um, and, and not allied where, you know, everybody jump on my back and, and we're going to go kill everything. But, you know, you help me out. I help you out um and 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 you know maybe we'll be indifferent and i won't eat you kind of deal um and then the other one um i set up where it was basically spent a lot of its time slumbering buried in the mud um very hard to find um but it, every once in a while it would be awake and it would go on a rampage so um you know that was kind of the two ways so that the two dragon turtles were there um but you probably didn't encounter them both at the same time they kind of knew about each other actually the the one that slept in the mud actually encountered the other dragon turtle, the recent arrival one, and actually wounded her. So, um, so there was no love uh, between those two. Um, so that's kind of how I, I balance that all out. So this was interesting because most seventh level, eighth level characters probably don't have a whole lot of uh, water breathing. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they have the spell. If if they have the spell, um, they're probably in good shape. But so we we put a couple of of ways in the module where you can get some water breathing. Um, but if you had a boat or something like that where you could float, you could you could actually do most of this level um, kind of traveling around, um, you know, on top of the water and then going to some of the various locations. So, so this would be a tricky one, probably the trickiest one to run um, a, a, as an adventure, because if they don't have a boat, if they don't have water breathing, yeah. um, they could run into some serious trouble. Like you basically, when you arrive, you arrive above the water and then you just fall right into it. Yeah. It's not that deep, but like, you know, if you're in plate mail and you can't water breathe, already you're probably going to be in trouble so um kind of interesting any thoughts that you have on the water elemental node 
Well, one of the things that I liked you called out immediately, which is the idea of the different seas, the idea of the, the colder and the kind of almost like each corner has its own kind of thing going on and certainly a north south difference. And I love that. I love where it's even labeled right in the areas, you know, kind of North Sea and this kind of thing. Um, it gives a lot of variety because, again, this is an area when I originally looked at it and read the work. I looked at this big room kind of full of water and it looks like an enormous, almost one enormous cave until you really start looking at these little sub areas. Yep. And I, you think to yourself, how on earth am I gonna run that? And I think by divvying up the areas by element a little more where they get hotter and colder, I think by adding secluded areas, by putting that the kind of reverse topical elevation, you know, the depth in there, which I really like, I think it gives it a lot more personality um, I couldn't imagine anybody but you knowing your previous profession as I do <laughs> writing this, uh, you know, so I'm kind of glad you did. Um, and yeah, I think it's it's potentially a very dangerous level, uh, certainly the hardest to run from an elemental perspective, you know, as dangerous as fire may be, characters still tend to have their feet on the ground when they're in the fire level where yep. here they're absolutely out of their element and I if I recall, I think I even threw in a, re a ring of water breathing or water walking, or, or I absolutely threw at least one or two items in other levels, you know, that I worked on in the temple, thinking of this node, because I felt like the characters are absolutely going to need some items when they get in here, it's going to be, you know, such an alien environment. Yeah. Um, so it can certainly be challenging. Um, do you want to throw up your favorite area? Or do you want me to throw it out? Um, I'll go first. So okay. Yeah. So I guess you could say the PCs could really get in over their heads really quickly. Yeah. I don't. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> all right. That's just another service we provide, folks. So. Um, all right. So my favorite encounter. This is an odd one. I, I'll be very surprised if we cross over on this one. So. So mm. um, I love putting in little Easter eggs um to other things other modules um other first edition modules um in these i have a lot of fun with it since these were, were published back in originally published back in the 80s i love putting movie references and stuff into there and i and i know that the movie that i'm gonna gonna say is was not in the 80s but anyway it was back from kind of when i was from a from a, a while ago i believe that movie came out in the 90s but so anyway uh my actual favorite one for this is going to be um area number three because you're probably gonna hmm so this is basically a shelf up in the icy northern part, um, mm -hmm. and there's ice methods up there, and ice methods are cool. They have false appearance, mm -hmm. so they look like just shards of ice. So you you get to this shelf, this snowy shelf, and you don't see anything, and you start walking around on it, and, and there's a bunch of ice methods, and they basically then just step out of there, or they, you know, they look like they're all ice shards, and then all of a sudden they're not ice shards. Um, and then they attack, and they've got some cool uh, innate abilities, um, and, and they attack with surprise and there's like 12 of them or something. So they could, they could theoretically overwhelm you. Um, but the cool part about this encounter, um, is, is kind of like the hidden Easter egg. So first the cool part with their treasure, um, I took all their treasure and I, I gave them all clear crystals, which look just like ice. And then, you know, good luck trying to find that from regular ice. It's like, he basically looks like a pile of ice, but then there's actually something valuable there, but then hidden buried in the ice that the methods didn't even know about um is is a strange creature and um alana elena can actually pull up um a picture of it it's a goblin shark um and for those of you who don't know a goblin shark is actually a real thing mm -hmm. um and they're crazy looking they are the perfect you, you look at that picture those are real creatures folks uh, they live yeah. in deep water um and uh they're so alien looking aptly named um they their jaws actually extend out like a great white shark their jaws extend out but these really extend out so they can grab prey and kind of pull it back in um fascinating critters um and you look at that and and i wanted to do something kind of fun um so taking a page out of um austin powers and austin powers uh dr evil wanting sharks with freaking laser beams attached to their heads um those uh horns on their heads they're not really horns but that fleshy protrusion um looks like you could attach something to it and if you recall for those of you who have or number three expedition to the barrier peaks uh there was a specific laser gun that was like a bracer that would kind of go over mm -hmm. your arm like a sleeve and then it shot a laser bolt out so I have a, in the ice, a goblin shark with a freaking laser beam attached to it. And there's a couple of charges left on it that it could still work. Um, but if the PCs find this thing, 
Um, it, and it kind of, it also kind of, in, the inspiration a little bit was, um, you know, it's those old horror shows back, you know, you find an alien in the ice or you find, mm -hmm. you know, a mammoth in the ice or something. Yeah, the you thing. know, you just, you're digging up through the ice to find their treasure and, mm -hmm. and the snow. And you all of a sudden you come across this frozen shark with a laser beam kind of attached to its head. And you're like, what the hell? Um, and it's nice. I even reference where, what the item is and where you can find it in ore number three. Um, so that if you have that book, you could actually um, bring that and use that in your campaign. So totally off the wall, totally crazy. But, um, you know, hey, what the heck? Sometimes we have to have some fun when we're, when we're designing. There we go. I love callbacks like that. So I think that's awesome. And when I read that, I knew exactly where that was. You know, I, I can literally envision that picture, the laser, the wrist kind of laser thing. So it's like perfect. It's like made for a goblin shark. Head. Yeah. And and as you said, and I I when I first saw, you know, the, the images and the pages for this section, before I actually read the description of the room, I saw the picture of the goblin shark and I knew what it was because I yeah. love kind of like sharks and aquatic life and whale sharks and these different things. And I looked at it, I knew instantly what it was like. Oh my God, he put a goblin shark in there kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So again, this is why you should have done that section because I was just like, you know, it, it's, it's uh, when I would see different references to algae in one area and the goblin sharks in the other, you know, it's, it's coming from, uh, uh, you know, a source that knows what he's talking about. Um, so, all right, no crossover here. Um, I was kind of mixed between two areas for my favorite area. And they're honestly, they're very similar. So it was almost a toss up as to which one I picked. Um, so my kind of, I guess, tied areas would be uh, area number nine, the secluded lagoon, and then area 13, the hidden grotto. And both areas, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll side on the, go on the side of the hidden grotto as my winner, but both areas essentially contain a very powerful creature that, as mentioned earlier, can become your ally. And in the first instance, it is sort of the dragon turtle. I guess you could say the, the not the alpha dragon turtle yeah. the level, but the, the dragon turtle that, you know, seems to have gotten the worst of it from its, from its uh, you know, peer. Yep. And so you have an injured dragon turtle that also has been saddled with the throne, you know, and, and it's sort of in this situation where if you can help it extricate itself from this throne, or better yet, if you can heal it, then you can start gradually improving its reaction to you. And I really love that. Um, and in the, again, the area that's very similar, the hidden grotto, uh, there is a storm giant, and it's actually a storm giant hermit who's there. Um, and this female storm giant, who could obviously be a very terrible foe, could absolutely be a source of information if approached properly. And I really like that. Um, I think it gives a break from the action. I think it gives the characters a place of much needed information and help and, and potentially a place to rest even. So I like the way it's done. I think it's got a wonderful illustration. If we can put that up to Storm Giantess illustration, I like the way that came out. I think it evokes, you know, when you look at it, you almost think the character has been miniaturized and you're like, oh, wait, no, that's the giant. You know, that's that's a really big giant. <laughs> um, so that was actually my favorite area was the the hidden. I'm going to say the hidden grotto. I'll give it to the, the storm job. But it was a toss up between the two because they there's such a similar feel of a big creature that could absolutely annihilate you if it wanted to, but that you could work. And I like the whole dynamic between the two dragon turtles too i like the fact that one injured the other i like the fact that you know we're not just throwing two dragon turtles in there together because it'd be so overpowered but thinking about that interaction between the two thinking about ecology because it's something i try to do with my areas is really think about um like i think on the earth node i tried to think about there's a dragon list uh draco list and there's a uh, black dragon and I'm trying to think, would they get along? Would they not get along? Who would stick to what area? And, you know, you start thinking in those terms, which, again, is a little more modern gaming, perhaps. Um, but anyway, I love it. I, I love both areas, uh, both with the Dragon Turtle and with the Giantess. I think they're both wonderful areas. Awesome. Great. All right. Well, that wraps up our um, discussion on the Elemental Nodes. Uh, just in case uh, we had somebody uh, popped in the chat later um, looking for an update on the book or number six. So we'll give that to you guys once again. Um, I wish I could say that the book was in the warehouse, but it's not quite there yet. But literally the book should be arriving any day now. 
um, according to our sources. Um, as, as we've alluded to, there's a, a, a crisis with shipping containers in the world right now. Uh, we actually didn't even have all of the books shipped in one container, so they're going to be showing up in waves, essentially. Um, but the first container is supposed to arrive very, very soon. Um, very hopeful that shipping might even start, um, you know, sometime in August, but definitely, um, well, I shouldn't say definitely, but, you know, it should be happening in September. So I know everybody wants their books as quickly as possible. As soon as they hit the warehouse, they are going out the door. Yeah. Um, but it's going to take a couple of weeks because of how big the pre-order is. Um, so um, everybody sit tight a couple more weeks. But um, um, And as I mentioned, we have a lot of um, activities planned to um, kind of celebrate the release of uh, Temple of Elemental Evil in September. So check the website out for various stream shows that are going to be happening um, by us and some of our partners. Um, by 20 Sides Every Story, they're going to be still streaming their games um, and a couple of others. Um, so with that, we are going to start wrapping it up. Um, Rick, tell us about our next show. Sure. Our next show, and I just want to address the comments. Uh, thank you for the, the comment, Planet Buster. We, we love you guys, too. Um, <laughs> our next show is coming your way on September 12th at 8 p.m. again. And we're going to dive into, and I, I can't imagine we haven't gotten into this yet, but we're going to dive into the Slaver series now. Nope. We're going to go right into the first book there uh, and, and address the module A1, uh, Slave Pits of the Undercity. Uh, to me, an under, an, another uh, underappreciated gem. Um, and we're going to devote the show to that. And we will go through the rest of the, the Slaver series as well, going through the different modules. We may not do them all four shows in a row. We might spread them out a little bit. Um, but yeah, we'll eventually go through the entire, or that's our intent to go through the entire Slaver series because it's such a great series. Um, I personally had a lot of fun running the Slaver series over the years. So I've been anxious to get turned to that. So yeah, A1, Slave Pits of the Undercity at September 12th. Awesome. All right. And then we will zip to our Pearls of Wisdom. Rick, why don't you respond to that? Oh. <laughs> yeah. Why Everything. You know? Yeah, my 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 phone is is very talkative tonight. It seems. Um, <laughs> so, would you like me to start off with the pearl? Yeah, or? go for it. All right, it. sure. Um, I've said this before in previous shows, but this is just such a good example from what we're talking about tonight about the nodes, and that's uh, environment, environment, environment. When you're, you know, for the DMs out there, um, don't just throw a monster in a cave. When you're trying to think about really cool encounters, memorable places for your characters. Think about all those senses, environment. Think about what they see, how they're breathing, how they feel, the heat on their skin or the coolness. You know, Think about visibility, smells, you know, pressure, all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, third, different dimensions, like if you're in the water where creatures can be around you, if you've ever scuba dived, you understand the idea of you know, multiple dimensions. There's so many elements you can bring to an encounter. And I think the elemental nodes really dish that out in spades, you know, let us really take that element of an environment and jack it up to 10. Um, and I would advise you to do that in your regular encounters because it just will make things so much better and more memorable for your characters. Um, so that is my pearl wisdom is just take environment and run with it hard. Great, all right. And my pearl wisdom for this week um, is dungeon ecology. Um, we talked a little bit better about it. Um, you know, dungeon ecology, you can definitely take this too far. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I don't recommend doing that. But I do like a little bit back in the 70s and 80s, there was pretty much no dungeon ecology. And you never really, no, I shouldn't say never, but very rarely did you always make sure all your monsters had a water source and, you know, food source, adequate food source, a way in, a way out. But there are certain things like, you know, if you're going to have a trap on a door, there has to be a way you know, for the inhabitant in that room to either not to, to get into that room without triggering the trap every time, either he can, you know, disable it really easily and turn it back on, or, or there's another way in or something like that. Things like that water source, you know, there should be some sort of water source nearby. Um, and again, that kind of plays into the environment thing. You now all of a sudden you can have some water encounters, which is not a bad thing. Um, so, I mean, don't go crazy with it, mm -hmm. but you know, a little bit of common sense with it goes a long way to kind of explaining um, sometimes like why certain creatures are there. I mean, sometimes it is just a collection of humanoids or a collection of bugs or something. Um, but when you can kind of get a way to actually balance encounters by you with dungeon ecology, or like we talked about having 
Um, you know, maybe maybe there's too many orcs for the characters to face, but if you split them up into two different tribes with two different leaders, you might be able to play the orcs off of each other. You know, give them another opportunity to work their way around uh, what the core problem is. So, mm-hmm. um, so that would be my my pearl wisdom for the week is dungeon ecology. Great advice. Um, yep. Uh, so with that, we are going to sign off. Rick, what do you got to tell everybody? Share, share, look for us, you know, look for us on YouTube, all that good stuff. Oh, all that good stuff. All yes. right. Um, yeah, we always have to say this, right? Yes. Um, absolutely, folks. Uh, we're already digging the comments. Keep them coming. Um, if you like what you see, give us a follow. Uh, if you watch us later on YouTube, because we do post all our shows later on YouTube, give us a subscribe. It helps us a lot. Give us a like. And right now, I don't know if we mentioned it earlier on the Goodman Games website, we do have a sort of index of all our shows. We have a list of our, at least I think, first 20 or 21 shows and even our own favorite shows. We have a list uh, because, you know, we had to throw another top 10 in there. Um, So if you're looking for a past sort of index or listing of the shows and what books we covered and what shows for our various previous shows that are all up on YouTube, uh, you can get them all in one place and just go to the Goodman Games uh, news section. And you'll find that article about us. Um, yeah, and, you know, hopefully in the future, we'll kind of update that from time to time. So we always have like a sort of running index. Um, yeah, and we'll, and we'll put a link of that down below too. Absolutely, so guys, yeah. We will YouTube, include it in our in our text here. Uh, but yeah, just keep participating with us. Tell us the books you want to, us to cover. We always have our own ideas, but you know, as I learned when I was in the radio business years ago, it's not about like what we want to hear. We want to know what you want to hear, what you want to hear us discuss and review. It's uh-huh. very important to us. So please uh, keep keep that two-way street going. We love it. All right. All right. And with that, we will say good night to everybody. So everybody have a good couple of weeks and we will see you um, in the middle of September to talk about A1. Everybody have a good one. Good night, folks. <laughs>